for the man of God we have over there in this pulpit because he is a true man of God and we are getting the, the truth. We are getting fed. I mean, he's shepherding God's flock to, to say, you know, and I thank God for that, you know. Now, let me start by saying that uh, deception is one of Satan's most powerful weapons when it comes to believers and when it comes to would-be believers. Now, he is so slick. Now, when I was saying about the pulpit, he's, he's working through some ministers in the pulpit, and he's so slick that uh, he's getting people over, winning people over with that smooth talk and, and uh, that uh, undiscerning believers uh, get caught up in that. So we have to be able to discern a lie from the truth, especially when it comes to the pulpit. And a lot of these ministers are preaching and teaching doctrines of demons. Yes, I said it. Yes, I did. Doctrines of demons. That's what they're teaching. And we have to be able to discern that. Now, that's, that's what's been going on in a whole lot of churches today. But I can say this about Satan, and I'm not giving him any props or anything like that. But he is an accomplished speaker. He's an accomplished speaker. He's also an accomplished liar. And, and uh, he's also an accomplished deceiver. Matter of fact, Satan is the father of all lies. First lie was told, he told it. So, you know, there's a whole lot of churches that are preaching another Jesus. There's a whole lot of churches that are preaching another spirit. Now, I don't think that that's coming from, well, I know that it's not coming from the God of heaven. You may think it's coming from the God of this world. In these churches, these people are doing a lot of signs and a lot of wonders to glorify God. And I watch this stuff on TV, and a lot of this stuff that they are doing, it's not to glorify God. It's to glorify the flesh. It's to glorify the flesh. And uh, if you look at these things and you think to yourself, did any of this stuff happen in the Old Testament? No, it didn't happen in the Old Testament. Did we uh, see Jesus through reading the Bible, teaching these sort of things? No, we didn't see that. Now, did the apostles themselves experience the type of stuff that we're seeing on TV in some of these, from some of these preachers in the pulpit? No. It's a lot of deception going on right in this pulpit. Not in this pulpit, but in pulpits. You know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. But listen to what uh, it says in Ecclesiastes uh, 1, 9, and 10. It says, That which had been is that which shall be, and that which had been done is that which shall, shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. Is there a thing whereof it may be said, see, this is new? It had been long ago in the ages which were before us. Now, in other words, what I get out of that scripture is there ain't nothing new when it comes to the Lord. Nothing new. Everything in this book, it ain't new. So there ain't no new Jesus. There ain't no new spirit. There's nothing new under when it comes to the Lord. Now, let me give you an example of these teachings that we find in the scripture. You know, if, if uh, you hear somebody preaching in a pulpit and they tell you something and you go back, and Pastor Bob tells us all the time to uh, test the spirit. 
that person that's teaching, that's a spirit. That's a spirit. So we have to go back and test the spirit with this word right here. We have to get this word and see if that, what that person is teaching, if it's really the truth or not. Because, see, this is the absolute truth. This is the only absolute truth. So we have to go back and test the spirit and see what's going on by reading God's word. Now, I've also heard people say that the Lord is doing a new thing. You ever heard that? The Lord is doing a new thing? But we know from reading this word that the God we serve, he don't change. So how is he doing a new thing? He don't change. As a matter of fact, it says in Malachi 3.6, that for I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. If the Lord changes, that means the Lord is lying. So we're going to be consumed by the devil because the Lord is on the same page with the devil. If he changes, but God said he don't change. Who you going to believe? All right, then. Now let's go back to the garden. From the very beginning of creation, Satan has been the enemy of our souls. He has been our enemy from the very beginning, and he has used deception to change the truth about God from the very beginning. You ever had a burning passion for somebody that you really love? You got a burning passion for Floyd because you love that man, you know? I had a burning passion for my wife because I loved her. But see, Satan is the same way. But he got a burning passion for destruction and deception. That's where his passion lies. And let me tell you something. The dude is relentless. He's relentless. You know, and again, I ain't giving him no props. But Satan is good at what he does. That's why we have to be good at what we do when he comes to getting into this word. We have to read this word and obey this word. That way we can be good and we can come back, you know, the tricks of the devil. Now, the tactics that uh, Satan uses, they are, they are deadly. And they have an eternal sting. Eternal sting. If you stay in that passageway, it can bring you to eternal ruin. Now, as we of the church, we got to learn just how skillful Satan and those demons that are back in him, how they, uh, uh, skillful they are when it comes to believing false doctrines. And now, and there's a lot of false doctrines being taught in the pulpit, you know, because you got people uh, preaching half truths. And there's a whole lot of counterfeit, uh, counterfeit now, spiritual experiences that people are putting out there. And we have to be aware of this stuff. You know, it's God's desire that all people repent and that all people be saved. That's his, his desire. But at the same time, Satan, as I said before, who's the father of all lies, he deceives the very people who need to accept this truth right here. He deceives them. Now, before I, want to, I go any further, I just want to make something plain and clear, get something straight. This book right here, this book is not about the truth. This book is of the truth. The very essence of this book is of the absolute truth. This is the word of God. Not about the truth, but it's of the truth. Now, in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4, it says that the God of this age, which is Satan, has blinded the mind of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. The God of this age, that's Satan. He's blinded the minds of unbelievers. Now, spiritually speaking, deception it goes a whole lot deeper than being tricked or lied to. It goes a whole lot deeper than that. So in order to be saved, we don't need to have uh, a particular 
whole lot of, of intelligence. We don't need to have that. We don't need to have a, a special philosophical abilities. We don't need to have that. And we don't need to have a whole lot of wisdom. We don't need to have a whole lot of wisdom to be saved. In fact, all that stuff I just mentioned, man uses all that, the wisdom, the philosophical beliefs and all that stuff. He used all that intelligence that he has to find more sophisticated ways to sin. See, if we used all those abilities in the right way in the word of God, by reading the word of God and obeying the word of God and walking in the word of God, we don't need all those things, but yet still, man uses those things to create more sophisticated ways to sin. Now, look at all the different ways a man doesn't come up with to sin. TV. Most of them didn't have TV. <laughs> but man doesn't come up with those ways to sin. The internet. The telephone. Even Adam didn't have no telephone. But man has come up with all these different things, and, and they use those to sin. And these are just a few. You know, I mean, there's a whole lot more ways, you know, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. And uh, I think that the, uh, the key to understanding spiritual deception is the fact that God won't interfere with man's free will. And a lot of times, that means that we'll choose what we want to believe rather than what we should believe. So we'll do that even in the face of evidence. That's the way man is. He'll choose what he wants to believe rather than what he should believe in the face of evidence. Now, what I mean by that is the truth can be staring a person right in the face and they don't believe it. They won't believe it. Listen to what it says in Luke 16, 31. It says, if they do not hear and listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded and convinced and believe, even if one should rise from the dead. Now, after Jesus did all those miraculous signs, everything that he did, walked on water, raised people from the dead, and, and, and all this, and he did all this right in the presence of his disciples. They looking at the man when he did it, but they still didn't believe it. The Bible says it. They still didn't believe it. It says that in John 12, 37. Read that when you get a chance. Now, notice that they wouldn't believe Jesus despite all the miracles that he did. Everything that he did, they still didn't, didn't believe it. Now, to me, that's called willful unbelief. Willful. They did that because they wanted to. They didn't want to do the will of God at the time. They loved the Lord, but they didn't want to do the will of God at the time. We are just like that today. Willful disbelief. Now, the earliest and the clearest example that I can give you about uh, spiritual deception is uh, go back to the garden is Eve. Now, when that serpent asked Eve, he said, uh, God didn't really say. And then Eve went on to elaborate on what God said. She quoted God word for word. Word for word, she quoted what God said. Now, at that very point, when she was talking to that serpent, she knew what to do, and she knew what not to do. She knew that. So the serpent tempted her with what she could gain by disobeying the Lord. Bottom line is, Eve was lied to. She was lied to. She was deceived because that, that serpent, the devil, he was very, very cunning, but... Ultimately, she chose to disobey God. Even though she could quote him word for word verbatim, she still chose to disobey the commandments that God had gave them. 
And then when she was confronted with her sin, what did she say? I'll tell you what she said. She said, Lord, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. That's what she said. Now, the original word for deceive, it implies uh, trickery and craftiness. And sometimes it's translated as seduced. Now, let's say that seduction is the appropriate way to think of the deception of Eve. Now, she knew full well what God had said, but she chose to obey God because she wanted what that serpent had offered her. Well, what he had cleverly offered her. She wanted that. Now, that same dynamic is working in this world today. It's working right here today. The same thing. I mean, it ain't changed. From the beginning up until 2013, it ain't changed. It's still going on today. And everybody who rejects God does so because in some way, deep down in their heart, they really don't want to obey the Lord. They really don't want to obey the Lord. And I'm telling you the truth. There was a time that I didn't want to obey the Lord. There was a time when y'all didn't want to obey the Lord. And any time that somebody that you see, family member, stranger on the street, that's disobeying the Lord or rejecting the Lord, that's willful disobedience or willful uh, rejection. Now, in other words, we are tempted by our own evil desires. So we got evil desires too. And it tells us that in James, James 1, verse 14. Now, that's not to say that every unbeliever is blatantly and spitefully turning from what he knows is true, but the unbeliever's desire for self-satisfaction, that's what makes Satan's deception more potent. See, out of our own desires, it makes Satan strong in our life. So if we get the desire for this word to replace that, then God would be first in our life. And we could tread on Satan, just like he's been treading on us. Amen? Now, anyone who resists God, he risks falling into spiritual deception. You see, nature abhors a vacuum. And that void is created by eviction of truth. And that void is soon going to be filled by something less than truth if we're not in this word. If we're not grounded and rooted in this word, that void is going to be filled with something else. Falsehood, deception, lying, stealing, and everything else that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Now, if you give up the truth, guess what? You just go believe anything. See, because there's one thing about the truth. I found this in my life. There's a difference we know between the truth and a lie. A lie, you got to disguise a lie. But you don't have to disguise the truth. You tell a lie. You got to tell another lie to clean up that lie. And then another lie to clean up that lie. And then after a while, you don't forgot which lie you told. Am I, am I right about it? You know, but the truth, you can't forget the truth. You can, it's impossible to forget the truth. But you can forget a lie, and more lies mount up. Now, Eve didn't sin in that garden because she was outmatched. No, she didn't sin because she was outmatched. She uh, was, did wrong when she thought she was doing right because she was deceived. Now, she was lied to, but she chose to listen to that lie. The same thing with us today. Sometimes we are lied to we, by Satan, and we ch uh, choose to listen to that lie. 
and then the downfall comes. But she also had a long look, just like we do, at what was forbidden. We do that today. And finally, she took that fruit in the hopes that she would have a better life. All because she was lied to and deceived by the devil. And when she did and Adam did what they did, sin and death came into the world. See, they was going to live forever right there in the Garden of Eden with the Lord. But when they disobeyed, see, disobedience is bad. Children, obey your parents so that your days will be long on earth. That's a commandment. And then it tells, it all goes on to say, fathers, don't drive your children to strife. You know, it works. It's a balance. It's a balance. Because all human sin is based on human choice. All sin is based on choice. It just don't pop up. No. You choose to sin. Well, we choose to sin. Like Pastor Bob always said, well, Lord, I guess I'll go out here and sin about 50 times today. You know? No, he don't say that. We choose to sin. But we know what to do when we sin as believers. We have an advocate with the Father. 1 John 1, 9. But when we reject the truth, we make ourselves vulnerable to a lie. And then, if we repeat rejecting, rejecting spiritual truth, that's going to bring spiritual deception. And then all these bad consequences are going to come into our lives. You might ask, why does God allow deception? Uh, why does God allow spiritual deception? Well, maybe God allows spiritual deception as a form of punishment for willful sin. Why do you think uh, Satan tries to deceive us in the first place? Because he wants us to believe something that's not true. That's why. And believers, not unbelievers, but believers, who are ignorant of this word right here, are more likely to be deceived. See, because if you don't know anything about this word, you're being deceived, but you don't know it. Because you're walking in deception. But if you are a believer, and you know this word, and you uh, deceived by Satan, you know it. And you're going to feel the effects of it. See, an unbeliever is going to walk around saying, why is all this happening to me? Why am I, uh, uh, I'm, I'm having bad luck and uh, I can't get no job, I can't keep no job, I can't keep no relationship? Why is all this happening to me? See, he don't know what's going on because he don't know nothing about the word. But you as a believer, if this stuff starts happening to you, it should click, that light bulb should go off. Uh-oh. I'm living outside of this word. I need to get back into this word. Because this is the only stability that we have. This is the only stability in our life that we have, is this word right here. Everything else is secondary. Everything else is secondary. If we begin to accept Satan lies as the truth, then the devil's going to build a stronghold right here. If we start accepting those lies as the truth. Uh, what is a stronghold? It's uh, incorrect thinking. That's what it is. It's based on error. It's based on lies. Especially when a person has received the truth in the first place. Let me give you an example. There are a whole lot of people, Pastor Bob says this all the time, they are feeling guilty and they're feeling condemned because of what went on in their past. 
Now, a lot of folks, they're going to feel dirty, they're going to feel unworthy, and they're afraid to even approach God. They're afraid to even start a relationship with the Lord. Because the devil has put that stronghold right up here in their mind. And he continually reminds people of the bad things that they did in the past. God didn't forgive you for that. Who you think you are? You ain't good. You ain't righteous. And that's a stronghold. And we believe that. And nothing don't go right because we believe that stronghold that the devil doesn't set up in our mind. Because what happens is we see that little old sin is much bigger than the blood of Jesus. Ain't nothing bigger than the blood of Jesus. You ain't got no problem larger than the blood of Jesus. You don't, I don't, nobody does. The blood of Jesus Lord, help me. The blood of Jesus is the ultimate, the ultimate that washes away all sin. The Bible says that. So all our little problems are nothing when it compared, compared to the blood of Jesus. But that's the picture that Satan and his demons are painting our brain. That's the picture that we see when we're not grounded in this word. Now, if God chose to make us a new creation, why are we thinking about what went on in the past? We're thinking about it because we're not rooted and we're not grounded in this word, and Satan has built that stronghold in our brain. That's why we think about it. But we shouldn't be thinking about that if we know that we're a new creation in God. Because the past ain't no more. Just like a newborn baby. That baby ain't got no past. We don't have no past after we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and we repent of our sin and do that 180. Not that 360, but that 180. Because all of our past sin are covered under that precious blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And that sin has spot and blemish, but the blood of Jesus don't have no spot and no blemish. So we are cleansed. You see, the devil has convinced so many of God's children to believe in that lie that he's making them feeling just downright defeated and they feel hopeless. Now, is that the way of a child of God supposed to act? No. No. Especially after the Son of God has come and shed his blood to remove all of our sin. We ain't supposed to be acting like that. We're not supposed to be acting defeated. We're supposed to be rejoicing. We're supposed to be standing up like uh, children of God. We're supposed to be standing up like men and women of God. We need to stop letting the devil take control of our lives. You know, we need to put our foot on the devil's head. And walk like a man and a woman of God. Amen? Amen? Now, another way that the devil tries to deceive us is getting us to see God incorrectly, in a different light. You see, Satan wants God's people to see their Heavenly Father as a, a, a dictator or somebody that's cold and somebody that's distant. Now, why does... Why do you think that he wants to do that? Well, because it's going to keep us from drawing close to the Lord. And it's going to keep the Lord from drawing close to us. And it's going to keep us from having an intimate relationship with God, what God so dearly wants. All he wants is us to have an intimate relationship with him. Because he is our father. Don't you have an intimate relationship with your children? Yeah. If you love them, you do. That's what a father does. He wants to have a relationship with his children. But the devil put that stronghold up here, and he tries to keep her away from God. But a lot of folks are afraid, you know. But the word says, this word says, God, uh, perfect love casts out fear. 
He cast out fear. He says that in John, 1 John 4, 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear had torment. He that feared is not perfect in love. So if you're afraid to get close to God, you're not perfect in love. So the only thing I can tell you to do is stop it. Get in this word. Get close to the Lord. Get perfect in that love and so that love can cast out that fear. Now the Bible says there's no fear in the Lord. But it also says we should fear the Lord. Now, that's a different type of fear. That's a respectful fear. That's a, a reverence for the Lord. You know, a person who properly fears the Lord, he's not going to go out and mark God's name. He's not going to do that. But he's not going to be afraid of the Lord either. Because when you fall down on your knees and pray, you should walk into the throne room of God boldly and let your petitions be known to him. Now, I'm not saying go in there disrespectful, but you go in there respectfully with reverence for the Lord. And he answer prayers. Now, God's word clearly tells us to watch out because the devil would just love to get our minds all messed up and muddied up concerning our relationship with God through his tool of deception. Now, 2 Corinthians eleven three, it says, But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguile or deceive Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. So, that's a weapon of deception. So how do we counteract this weapon of deception? Well, let me ask you this. What is deception based on? You got to know that first. Deception is based on error. Deception is based on a lie. And deception is based on untrue assumptions. That's what deception is based on. So how do you counter that lie? With the truth. With the truth. And where do you find the truth? It's right here. In this word of God. The devil says things to you like, oh, God don't love you. You know, you committed adultery with that man's wife over there. God don't love you. You committed adultery with that that a uh, woman's husband, God don't love you. These are the things that he'll put into your mind, you know. But the word says, we are loved for who we are, not for what we've done. See, God loves us for who we are. All you got to do is repent of that sin or what you've done, whether it be adultery, murder, or whatever. If you repent of it and truly re mean it in your heart. See, God looks at the in in inside of the cup. Well, we as men, we look at the outside. See, we can't get in there and look at that heart. But God looks at the heart. And, and he loves us for what we are and not for what we've done. And guess what? Before we accepted Jesus at all, before we even accepted Jesus, Christ gave his life for us. Before we even accepted him, he gave his life for us. Proof? Way back there, over 2,000 years ago, we weren't even born. So we couldn't accept him, but he still gave his life for, for us because he knew aforehand that we were going to be born. And so he died for us. The Bible says, yet, when we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So all we have to do is just turn back to our Heavenly Father, repent of our sins, because he wants that relationship with him to be restored. Now, the Bible says in uh, 1 John 2, 1, My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. But I can hear the devil saying, when I read that scripture, I can hear the devil saying this, Yeah, well... 
God may forgive you, but your relationship with him will never be the same. But I can also hear God saying, God will not only forgive us, but he deeply resides to be gracious to us. And our Heavenly Father wants to restore that precious relationship that we once had with him, no matter what. He still wants that relationship. Isaiah 30, 18, And therefore will the Lord wait that he may be gracious unto you, and therefore will he be exalted that he may have mercy upon you. For the Lord is a God of judgment. Blessed are they that wait for him. Isaiah 1, 18, Come now and let us reason together, said the Lord. Let us reason together, said the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Now, since we as believers are vulnerable to satanic snares, it's very imperative that we, as believers, young and old, distinguish, like I said before, the true from the false. Now, Proverbs 18, 17 says, the one who states his case first seems right until the other comes and examines him. Now, in other words, what that's saying to me is like, how many times have we seen this play out in the courtroom? Now, a good defense lawyer, he's going to have you, say you the jury, he's going to have you convinced that his, his client is completely innocent, okay? Now, then comes the cross-examination. This is scripture I just read, which can leave you even more convinced that that person that you was just getting ready to exonerate is almost certainly guilty. That's what that scripture means. And what I'm saying is this, on doctrinal matters, more important than earthly matters? I would say yes, they are. Do we take the same care to evaluate whether or not earthly matters are true? Are there are some people are so comfortable with their little circle of influence that they just don't want to listen to anybody else? This could be a dangerous practice, very dangerous. I can uh, almost tell you it guarantees that a person, if a person ever embraces false teaching from the pulpit, if a person ever embraces false teaching, most likely they are never going to leave it. And we don't want to see people caught up in that. That's why we have to be discerning and know the truth from a lie. Now, we're talking about deception. Reminds me of this young man. <laughs> he deceived his parents. Now, this young fellow had a, a curfew in his house. And he had stayed out beyond curfew. So he was trying to figure out, how am I going to get in the house without mom and dad knowing? Because he done stayed out past his curfew. Okay, on the way home, he stopped by the phone booth, which we don't see a lot anymore. <laughs> anyway, he called home. So his mom picks up the phone, she answers the phone, hello. He don't say anything. So mom says, hello. He still don't say anything. So she says, hello, who is this? So he says, it's okay, mom, hang up the phone, I got it. <laughs> so he deceived his parents. All he did was wait until they went to bed, slipped into the house, and they never know what hit him. Okay. Okay. I uh <laughs> Anyway, 
Anyway, uh, I'm going to uh, get ready to close here. Now, the, uh, we know that from the beginning, Satan has been monitoring our progress as, uh, as humans. He's been doing that from the beginning of, uh, of the world. Now, the, the main purpose of him monitoring us is to draw us away from God. That's his main purpose, and uh, put our attention on him. So, I'm going to ask you, what's our part in all this? To keep Satan from doing that, even though he's been doing it from the beginning. Well, I say we need to stop meditating on the deception of the devil and start feeding ourselves on this word right here and start meditating on this word right here. Now that way, we can start tearing down those strongholds that the devil has put in our minds and renew our minds with the word of God. And guess what? Our feelings are gonna reflect those changes. Now, I'm gonna ask you this morning, you know, are you ready to be absent from the body and present with the Lord? You know, because if you're not ready to be absent from the body and present with the Lord, you're in a bad place. Because the Bible tells us when we die, we are absent from the body and present with the Lord. But if you're an unbeliever and you believe in the deceptions of Satan, yeah, you're going to be absent from the body but you're not going to be present with the Lord. And that's a eternity upon eternity upon eternity of being not present with the Lord. Total separation from God. I don't want that. Matter of fact, I ain't having that. No, you know. But I uh, want to leave you with this. This is a joke of escape. Uh, this guy was sick, and he had to go to the doctor, and he asked the doctor, he said, doctor, there's something going on inside of me. I'm just not feeling well. And the doctor said, well, we're going to do some x-rays, and we'll find out what's going on. So the doctor x-rayed the fella, and he told him, he said, you got three worms inside of your body. We're going to have to do surgery to get them out. So the worms heard that. And then one worm told the other one, he said, did you hear that? He said, yeah, I heard that. What you going to do? He said, I'm going to hide behind the heart. What you going to do? He said, I'm going to hide behind the liver. So they asked the third worm, he said, what you going to do? He said, I'm going to catch that 815 out here in the morning. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>